Hello, uh, welcome, uh, and I hope it's welcome back to Golden Anniversaries, uh, Saint Cinema St. Louis's uh, uh, series of films celebrating their 50th anniversary. Um, these are all films from 1972. Uh, my name's Cliff Freilich. I am the former executive director of Cinema St. Louis, retired several months back at this point, but I'm uh, bringing the plane uh, to a landing here with the regard to Golden Anniversary, since I was the person who programmed it. Uh, this is our last virtual conversation of the Golden Anniversaries uh, series for, uh, for 2022. There is still one more um, a live presentation that is uh, a, a screening at the St. Louis Public Library, and that will be on uh, Saturday, December 10th at 1230, a little earlier than normal for those of you who are attending on a regular basis. It'll be 1230 instead of 130 because of the length of the film, and that is The Godfather. So please join us uh, for The Godfather on December 10th. That'll be our final presentation of the year. There are uh, five additional Golden Anniversaries presentations that take place during the St. Louis International Film Festival, which kicks off very, very soon at this point, November 3rd through the 13th. Uh, there will be four films at the Public Library, all free, as they always have been. And that will be Boxcar Ber Bertha, um, uh, The Seduction of Mimi, uh, Superfly and Jeremiah Johnson. All of those will, as always, be accompanied by introductions and uh, discussions afterwards. And then we have one special presentation at Webster University. It's the one uh, film uh, in 50th uh, in these uh, Golden Anniversaries presentations that we're going to make you pay for. Um, that is John Waters' Pink Flamingos. Uh, viewer discretion advised um, at Webster University. Uh, so please uh, check out the full SLIF schedule, uh, which is now announced and available, and tickets are on sale at uh, SLIF or at cinemastlouis.org. So please um, check it out. All right, we just have a word of thanks, and then I'll introduce the person who's going to be. Uh, both talking about initially, and then we'll uh, ask you to join him for a discussion of Cries and Whispers, which is our film tonight, obviously. But we first want to thank the St. Louis Public Library. They are our partners in Golden Anniversaries. They've been helpful not only in hosting these, but also helping underwrite uh, aspects of our uh, presentations. So we want to thank them for their um, uh, year-round help in presenting this. Uh, and again, uh, there are still plenty of more films to see at the library before the conclusion of the year. All right, the person who is going to be uh, leading our discussion tonight is TJ Keeley. Uh, TJ is our uh, very first, uh, he's doing his very first presentation on behalf of Cinema St. Louis. We're always happy to have an infusion of fresh blood. Uh, so we uh, welcome his uh, participation. He's a PhD student in contemporary American literature at St. Louis University. He's uh, in the process of finishing his dissertation. Uh, he's also a teacher of English and film uh, at St. John Vianney uh, Preparatory School here in St. Louis. So uh, let's welcome him to talk about cries and whispers. And then afterwards, um, I'll rejoin him and you can participate by asking questions and making your own observations. Just put those in the chat function and I'll relay them to TJ. Take it away, TJ. All right, thank you, Cliff. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here, share my presentation. Um, okay, so I think, yes. All right, we should be able to see uh, the presentation up close here. And hi, again, my name is TJ Keeley. I'm presenting on Cries and Whispers today, the 1972 film by Ingmar Bergman. I hope today to present a few uh, close looks, is what I'm calling it, a few different ways of understanding, interpreting, or analyzing Cries and Whispers. While it is a short, rather intimate film, it is one that opens itself up to a lot of ambiguity, um, analysis through dialectics, analysis through myth, familial relationships, uh, ethics, metaphysics, a whole lot of different things. And I hope not to present myself in any way as an expert on this, but rather as a cinephile, a Bergman fan, and somebody who was really, really curious about learning more about this film. I did the kind of classic mistake of overwriting on my presentation. So you'll please forgive me if I, if I speed through some rather text heavy slides at, at some point, but I will make, uh, my presentation available to anyone who's interested afterward. So what I hope to do 
today is to take us through a brief introduction um, where we'll look at the history, um, where this film, Cries and Whispers, places in Bergman's filmography, do a brief summary of the plot and an overview of some of the major um, you know, analytical threads that are available in Cries and Whispers. After that, we'll do an examination of form and structure, particularly paying attention to the use of colors in the mise-en-scene, uh, to look at compositions, particularly involving mirrors, frames, doubling, and repetitions, and then to consider the narrative structure and the different narratologies that are available in the film. In the middle portion, um, I really want to consider the close-up and the implementation of the close-up in this film, because as I'm sure you noticed, close-ups and medium close-ups are uh, sprinkled all throughout. They dominate, really, the compositions of this film, and I think they, they beg to be examined more closely. Fourth, we'll look at other critical approaches very briefly in the research that I found, uh, namely some feminist critiques, and then, as I mentioned previously, um, Bergman's more sort of philosophical inclinations and some of the ambiguities that arise uh, throughout the film. And then finally, we will have a question and answer portion at the end. So with the introduction, just to give you a brief background of Ingmar Bergman, uh, he was a Swedish filmmaker, a screenwriter and dramatist. I'm sure that if you're tuning into a discussion like this, you're familiar with Bergman, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on his biography, but it's worth noting that he directed films for you know, about 60 years, a large portion of the second half of the 20th century. Over that time, he made actually over 39 feature films and documentaries. If you've seen or if you know much about Bergman, even, even kind of the basis about Bergman, you probably know that he's concerned with the medical metaphysical problems of the human condition. His other prominent themes are the silence of God in the face of human suffering, which is something that maybe we see in Cries and Whispers. There's a little bit of um, discussion about whether he actually left that theme behind by the time he got to this film or not. Um, and in different universe, and then of course, capacities for human cruelty and the compassion towards one another, which I think is you know, really on the surface and within the text of the film that we're discussing today. Some of the more famous of his films, although he's one of those directors whose filmography is really just peppered with sort of greatest hits, you, you might have heard of The Seventh Seal or seen The Seventh Seal. Um, he's really known for his Silence of God trilogy as well, that includes uh, Through a Glass Darkly, Winter Light and the Silence. Um, perhaps his most famous film is Persona. We have, of course, Cries and Whispers, which we're talking about today. It was nominated for, I think, five Academy Awards. And that was a rare feat to be nominated for uh, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenwriting for a film not in the English language in 1972. The film did win the Academy Award for Cinematography. Um, he also made a film, Scenes from a Marriage, and Fanny and Alexander. Those were both films that were released in longer television versions in his home country, but then sort of came to the States in truncated three hour long films. And of course, uh, Scenes from a Marriage was recently given a modern remake through HBO as a limited series. Even films he did not direct, there are films that uh, bear a strong mark of his legacy. So considering a documentary like Searching for Ingmar Bergman, which comes out in 2018, it's sort of a series of interviews with directors who explicitly acknowledge the debts that they're owed to his influence. And then Mia Hansen Love's film from 2021 uh, called Bergman Island, which takes place on Faro Island during a Bergman film festival and has a lot to do with, you know, a lot of the themes that Bergman himself tackled, like the male and female relationships, the relationship between art and artist, uh, writing about one's life, uh, the liminality between fiction and and biography, and it was a really kind of interesting film that is infused with his spirit while kind of taking another, another look at some of those main forms and concerns. Looking, just focusing for a moment on where Cries and Whispers comes in his filmography, um, if you don't know much about the films that preceded it, films like The Hour of the Wolf, Shame, The Right, and The Passion of Anna are films that are more explicitly dealing with what we might call metaphysical, ethical, or religious themes. Um, they're really rather, rather serious, kind of stereotypically Scandinavian, um, you know, um, philosophical films. And the Hour of the Wolf is one in particular that deals with um, sort of a father dealing with the rape of his daughter. And it's a film that influences some of the later work of Wes Craven, actually. 
And then Cries and Whispers comes at this turning point in his filmography where um, he's he's going less from sort of man's dealing with the silence of God and more into human relationships inside uh, some settings of naturalism, settings of, I'm sorry, settings of realism and settings of kind of classical chamber dramas. Um, this was a transition period often described as shifting to the philosophical, or sorry, from the psychological element uh, towards the, the more physical element. Moving forward a bit, um, Bergman claimed to be done with God as a theme, but knowing what happens in this film and then the extended sequence with the priest after Agnes dies, I think this is something that perhaps we could bring up in the discussion later about how much of this still haunts Bergman's filmography. But uh, Frank Gatto said about this film, uh, the Cries and Whispers comes at, at the time that Bergman begins to acknowledge a feminine component within himself and that he had previously suppressed. As a result, he said he had rejected his former practice of conceiving his characters as solely male or female. Something that will come up later in this presentation and hopefully in the question and answer is to what degree it is imperative that we read these characters as distinctively female and actually then push back on Frank Gatto's claim here about the characters not being conceived of as explicitly uh, gendered or sexualized one, one particular way. Um, so that's hopefully something we can revisit later in the presentation. Just giving a very brief summary of the plot. I know everyone who has watched, who's, who's here has likely watched it, but I think it's worth taking just kind of a bullet point refresher here. Um, it's 19th century. Um, Agnes is dying of cancer. It's either cancer of the stomach or cancer of the uterus. Uh, based on whatever I read, there was sort of a disagreement about that and what thematic implications of where her cancer was and the nature of her cancer had for other themes and analyses of the film. She's watched over and visited by her sister Maria and her sister Karen, um, as well as Anna, who is the servant of the family. Um, Anna, we learn early on, had a daughter that passed away. She still prays to God about the daughter and still has the crib in her bedroom. When a doctor visits early in the film, um, it jogs Maria's memory about an affair that she had with the doctor, and then the ensuing fallout that it has with her husband, who then tries to take his own life. After Agnes dies, we have the aforementioned visit from the priest, where, wherein he says that he remembers um, talking to Agnes during her initiation rites and that she had a stronger faith than he had. Um, Maria tries to, you know, emotionally but also physically touch Karen. Karen is the one who is very emotionally isolated, you could say cold, uh, repressed. And that jogs Karen's memory then, wherein she engages in an act of self-harm in order to repre uh, repel her husband, Frederick. Um, after this, Karen and Maria dine and talk about rewarding Agnes's devotion to Anna with some sort of moment memento. Uh, there's resentment that Karen has for Anna's closeness with her sisters. Uh, the sisters have a falling out and perhaps have an attempt at reconciliation. This is again, something that'll come up later with the ambiguity of the ending. At some point, um, Agnes returns to life as seen through the perspective of Anna. This has been argued as existing in a sort of dream state, as some sort of liminal space between life and between death. The degree to which we're supposed to, to accept that this is happening on face value is again a source of um, a source of dispute among critics and among scholars. And then towards the end, the family sends Anna away with no sort of severance, nothing but Agnes's diary as the last memento that she gets to have for her friend and perhaps lover from the previous life. Uh, Maria rebukes Karen about the night that they had before where she said that, you know, we should be friends, we should be sisters, we have this connection. She claims not to remember this human connection that the sisters shared. She says something horribly dismissive, like, I can't remember every foolish thing I've done, and I certainly can't be accountable for them. And then at the end, Anna reads about the special moment that Agnes had uh, on a swing with her sisters, and she reflects, come what may, this is happiness. And I, again, hope to revisit that later in the presentation and really tease out the implications of that ending. So looking at formal structure, I'm not going to run through all of this here, but I borrowed from the uh, critic A. Rodriguez Serrano, and he basically broke the film down into 16 different focalizations, 16 different sequences. Because what he, one of the things he argues is that the film has a layer of different narrators that allow for uh, a splitting of 
perspective, a splitting of internal focalization and a splitting of sort of the way that we see the soul at the center of the film. And so the, the opening, which I'm, I'm not going to play this clip, but if you can see here from the, the clip in the lower right hand corner, it's a lot of establishing shots outside, giving us the rather neutral space. It's dawn, so it's the beginning of a new day, but at the same time it's fall, so it's the end of a season where we have death, decay, dying within the natural setting. And it's within a certain unspecified time. There's also references here. Um, a lot of a lot of writers have pointed out that that's uh, Orpheus with his lyre that you can see in the in the photo there. So we already have a connection of the text of this film with a mythic story of somebody who's able to visit the afterlife, um, but because they look back, because they're stuck essentially gazing backwards towards the past, that they're they're then stuck again in this liminal space between between life and death. So we get a series of introductions to each of the women. Um, all of this taking place essentially in the first day. And so it's kind of easy to forget that um, actually the doctor's visit is sort of just in the in the first evening and then the death is at the end of the first night. So Agnes's flashback is the first one that we get. And each of these flashbacks is punctuated by that close up and intense red and black where we get um, sort of whispering on, on the soundtrack. And that, that punctuates the beginning and the end of sort of bookends, the flashbacks that we get. The three scenes in Agnes's flashback are focused primarily on her childhood, uh, the way that she remembers her mother as this very vibrant figure, always in the present, and that she had a jealousy of the way that her mother lived and the affection that her mother and her sister Maria had. Interestingly, both her mother and her sister Maria are played by the actress Liv Ullmann, and again, we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, after this, we get um, the ritual, which has a zero focalization. In fact, there's an interesting bit in the ritual with the priest where the camera continues to switch close-ups, long extended close-ups between each of the women and the priest, as if looking for some sort of surface or some sort of affect image to hold on to in order to understand the um, the sort of metaphysical moment that's going on there, but not really finding one to settle on. After this, we have flashbacks and three scenes to Karen's life, um, those taking place more in her maturity. Um, I think I skipped, I'm sorry, I skipped uh, Maria's life. Maria's life was, or her flashback took place in her youth, and that's where we learn about her affair with the doctor. Um, Karen's are in maturity. So within the flashbacks of those three women, we move, even though it's different individual subjects, we move through the stages of sort of maturity of the soul from childhood to youth to maturity. And then finally, of course, ending in the death of Agnes. And then after that, our internal focalization in what I'm calling Anna's dream, again, exists in that sort of time unspecified. Uh, and finally, at the end, we're back into time unspecified in the epilogue, and that takes place through this um, sort of communication between the consciousness of Anna and Agnes that takes place through the reading of the diary. So looking next at uh, time and the prominence of red here. So again, with Rodriguez Serrano, he wants us to acknowledge three different narrators, uh, three different levels of narration throughout the film. First, he refers to as the filmic, ne filmic mega narrator. Um, and that is the, the narrator responsible for the framing and physical characteristics of each shot. I don't really have the time to get into all of this, but it's worth noting that is separate from the director. So it would be wrong to call this Bergman. Although, of course, Bergman is and Sven Nyqvist, his cinematographer, are responsible for the framing and the, meta and the physical characteristics of the shot, the filmic mega narrator is essentially the person we could understand telling the story of the film, not necessarily constructing the material reality of the film as we see it. Next, we have what's what he calls an extra diegetic narrator. That's the male anonymous voice that introduces um, Agnes and Maria's flashbacks. He speaks in very succinct declarative sentences, pretty much just saying many years ago at this house, here's how this woman got here. And then finally, we have the textual operator, who is our third layer of, of narrator, who is Agnes. We meet her at the beginning writing. We see her writing in her diary. And then on the soundtrack, we can hear her say, I believe something like it is Monday and I'm in pain. Then at the end of the film, we hear her narrating the passage that Agnes is reading about that one uh, nostalgic moment of happiness that she recalls having. Within Bergman's own 
he wrote two uh, two books, at least two books, about his own sort of autobiography and his own uh, filmography and method. And within there, in the script, he he says he began with the idea of this film as four women uh, in a room, in a, in a large red room. It almost sounds like it's a David Lynch beginning, um, but four women in a large red room. And he refers to them as the dying one, the most beautiful one, the strongest one, and the serving one. Interestingly, Maria, of course, we're going to consider the roles of women within this film and the role of motherhood. Maria, of course, is um, the name of the mother of, of Jesus in the Bible, and Karen is the name of Bergman's own mother. So there's a whole lot of things, interesting things that we can read there as far as implications go. Um, Andrea Sabadini, in her work, imagines the four of them sort of working together, the four of these feminine consciousnesses working together into one overall feminine consciousness that could be understood as body, suffering through body, suffering through mind, and suffering through distorted personality. Anna then is the more sort of um, angelic servant savior one, um, although another critic I point to later is going to push back on that a bit. Um, I'm going to move, move forward a little bit because we'll come back to the relationships between them. So <clears throat> going to red, I think this is important to pay attention to and, and to read the quote here from Bergman's book, Images. He says, all my films can be thought in black and white, except for Cries and Whispers. In the screenplay, I say that I have thought of the color red as the interior of the soul. When I was a child, I saw the soul as a shadowy dragon, blue as smoke, hovering like an enormous winged creature, half bird, half fish. But inside the dragon, everything was red. Uh, I feel like you could do a whole lot of like psychological reading on that. But um, what, what's interesting about this is if he's seeing the soul as red, then we can understand the... Uh, the setting that the film is in and the dominance of red and mise-en-scene as being sort of a projection or an expression of the soul cast outward. So then the setting itself, which primarily is within that mansion, and we get a an even smaller kind of microcosm of that early on in the visions of Maria, where there's several doll figures that she's framed with and then a doll house, we can sort of view the the mansion, the red mansion is like the interior soul writ large, or a sort of expressed onto the walls of the mansion. Um, Sydney, who who will show up in my work cited, um, it does a lot with red, talking about the expression of the red also then having to do with the expression of blood and blood as being kind of um, kind of the leaking of the soul, the exercising of the soul. And then he draws us to that moment of self-mutilation that Karen goes through as saying that there's a displacement and a combination there between uh, the soul, the blood, the red that is uh, labial, and that's the whisper, and then dental, which is the cry. And of course, she, as she uh, self-mutilates, as she mutilates her genitals, she then takes the blood and wipes it on her mouth and smiles. So there's the linking there of the way that Sydney's reading cries and whispers. It's not exactly the way that I read that title, but I thought it was uh, worth mentioning. And then Coates wants us to look at it as a dialectical relationship between he, he doesn't acknowledge black and white as colors. He says that they're hues, they're contrasting hues that through uh, a dialectic uh, combined conflict and then create the synthesis that is red. Um, and he says that it represents a sort of danger, a romance or a drama, which I think is perhaps a little bit too, too cliched of an understanding. But moving along, um, and this is another quote from Bergman talking about like the inside of the soul as a moist membrane. But what's interesting about this, borrowing from Coates in the second, the second quote, is that he wants to then see the film as a first-person mind screen. The possibility that the image field is retinal, um, he says it gives colors to the eyelids closed against intense light, that if you close your eyes and you shine in intense light, you see red. And thus the film then represents, because not just the walls are red, but often the kind of filter or the light that's placed over the image is red as well. It creates a private vision screen itself. Um, and this, again, sort of expresses or projects the pain and the painfulness of recollection. He says that this then stands, again, as the synthesis or as, as kind of a, a triangular point between white and black, white being um, innocent, virginal, pure, sort of uterine tabla rasa, whereas black then represents the sepulchral darkness. And thus there's a, an arc then between uh, where Agnes progresses wearing that white dress. So let's talk about the close-up. 
a lot of this film is told in close-up, and I have the exact number later, but it's something like 43.5% of the film is in either close-up or medium close-up. I know this because one of the times I watched it, I watched with a stopwatch and clicked it um, every time, even within the same shot, that a character would um, change the composition through their movement and thus place themselves in close-up or medium close-up. So the dominance of close-ups within this film, even unique and paramount among Bergman's own filmography, I think begs our attention. And for this, I'm going to borrow from uh, the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. And I'm going to, there's a lot of quotes here, but I'm really going to kind of water this down to what I think, as best I can, to what I think is really the important kind of germinal idea that he brings about the close up. In his books, Cinema and Cinema, Cinema One and Cinema Two, they're essentially taxonomies of images. And he refers to the close up as the affect image. He says, with a close-up, a close-up often, you know, it's on a face, otherwise a close-up of something else is just referred to as an insert. He says it shows a face which is an organ-carrying plate of nerves, which have sacrificed most of their global mobility, and which fathers or expresses in a free way all kinds of tiny local movement, which the rest of the body usually keeps hidden. Thus, there is no close-up of the face. The face itself, the face is in itself close-up. The close-up is itself face and both are affect. Um, yeah, it takes like seven minutes to read a page of his writing because you're like, wait, what? Um, but I think essentially what he's getting at here is there's, there's a merging of form and content. So for Deleuze, there is no purpose in saying a close-up of a face. Any, any close-up of a face is itself the affect image. It is what it represents. And so moving a bit further, he talks about how close-ups um, force the character to abandon their profession or their societal role. They're no longer able to communicate or no longer want to communicate. They're struck almost by a muteness, and thus they even lose individuation. So their, their uh, singleness, their single identity, their unique identity as a character, and even as a performer playing that character falls away. So if you look down here, this is not a close-up of Liv Ullmann, right? This is an affect image wherein both Maria and Liv Ullmann disappear and it becomes just pure affect, which we're gonna watch this scene again in a moment, a couple minutes of it, and um, see how that functions. So um, Bergman himself, quoted in Deleuze, says that the possibility of cinema and the distinct original quality of cinema has to do with the, the human face. And I think we can see that writ large within, within Cries and Whispers. I'm going to skip that bit and show you just some images here of other close-ups from Bergman's filmography. Primarily, a lot of the images that I have here are from Persona, which is from 1966. And it's a film that is uh, obsessed with identities, the merging of identities, the uh, dissolving between two women who, you know, one is an actress who is refusing to speak. So this takes us back to what uh, Deleuze was just talking about a moment ago, and the other is her caretaker. As you watch the rest of the film, and I'm really going to do a poor job describing this. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. If you have seen it, you need to watch it. Um, there, there seems to be a dissolution between the two of them. We, we begin to lose the distinction between who is who. Are they the same woman? Are they two sides of an expressed consciousness? Are they two distinct people who are losing senses of themselves? And so a lot of this film is precisely about um, the relationship between the face and individuation. We get um, shots like this one uh, that's in stark contrast. It's a silhouette uh, in profile of two women coming close together, a moment of intimacy, perhaps of erotic shared intimacy. Um, it's starkly dark black contrasting against the white. And again, it almost looks as though they're merging together at the nose. So it's two, it's two women, but it looks as though if this shot were to continue, they would sort of form together into one. There are also compositions throughout that film, and there's some in Cries and Whispers that look something like this. There's an obstruction between the two uh, faces within this composition. One we're seeing head on, which a lot of the time Nyquist and Bergman will use to show a sort of bare vulnerability, looking straight into the camera and creating another space off camera that outside of the frame that the viewer cannot see, but it opens up that frame. And then a character sort of in profile so that the character in profile is um, less involved, less powerless, a little bit more dismissed. But in a composition like this, it almost creates a, a composite face from the two sides. Uh, here's another example of that. Um, and then, sorry, if I go back, 
um, we can see something like that beginning here between the doctor and between Maria, where she is uh, infatuated, seduced, enamored by him, and he's sort of just passively eating, right? So she's facing us because she's the one experiencing the pure affect, and because he is um, indifferent, he's the one that is projected in, in, um, in profile there. So uh, moving a bit further, um, this is when we're talking about creating, creating the other mysterious narrative space in the portion of Cries and Whispers where Agnes has died and we're in maybe Anna's dream, maybe, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> she calls for her sisters to come in when Agnes comes back and each of them sort of moves into the frame, into an extreme close-up where it would suggest the purpose that close-ups are usually used for, which is emotional identification. However, Rodriguez Serrano points out that um, what it's actually depicting is the other mysterious narrative space. In looking directly into the camera, it's looking beyond the, the metaphysical world of the film and into some sort of fear in the void of absence or a fear in the face of nothingness. If we go back to Deleuze, Deleuze talks about how shots like this can create an effective reading of the entire film. They're not in isolation. You wouldn't say this is just an effective shot. You would say that the successive image and relationships or the domination, as we'll see at the bottom there, 43.5% of the film, of these shots creates an overall effective reading of the film. Uh, one that rises above mere representation and towards the recognition of some sort of other um, entity. So, oh, I don't want to play that. Nope. All right, moving along. So I, I do want to play briefly a scene here on the left of between the doctor and between Maria, where they uh, look at each other's faces through the mirror, and he describes to her how you've changed, he says. So um, I'm going to play this now. Is that OK, Bree? All right, let's see if this works. And I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit so we can get to the mirror. So it's big. You're back. Can't you be back here in the middle of the time? And you have changed. I will just say that you have changed. In the eyes, you cast a new, more snappy, calculated side of the camera. Before you saw it right in front, open, without a mask on it. Din mun har fått ett litet drag av missnöje och hunger. Förr var den bara mjuk. Din hy är nu mera blek. Du sminkar dig. Den fina breda pannan har fått fyra rispor ovanför vardera ögonbrynet. Nej, det kan du inte se det här ljuset. Men det syns i skarpt dagsljus. Vet du var de där risperna kommer ifrån? Likgiltigheten, Marie. Den här fina linjen från öra till hakspetsen. Den är inte så självklar längre. Där sitter bekvämligheten och lättjan. Och ser du även nesroten. Varför hånlär du så ofta, Marie? Kan du se det? Du hånlär för ofta. Ser du, Marie? Under ögonen, de vassa, nästan omärkliga rynkorna av leda och otålighet. Kan du verkligen se allt det där i mitt ansikte? Nej, men jag känner det när du kysser mig. Jag tror du driver mig. Jag vet var du ser det. Så, hur skulle det vara? Jag ser det i dig själv. Okej, okay. jag ville ändra den part av det klippet där. Så, okej. So, oh no, don't play it again. Um, I'm sorry. All right, uh, talking about those scenes, um, I want to make sure that this is still, there we go. Okay, um, talking about that scene. So it's, it's done in close up, as we mentioned, and what he's doing, what the doctor is trying to do is he's trying to describe the past of Maria. He's, he's using it obviously as a way of putting her down. It's really rather misogynistic. It's a way of saying that the affection and the relationship that you're projecting onto us, I'm actually seeing that you're not as beautiful anymore because now you sneer, now you do this, right? 
She, and he, she asks, can you actually see that? And he says, no, I can't see it. So it's not on the surface, but I feel it when you kiss me, which is something that is um, effective, right? It's not, it's not really about observing through the actual image that's being seen there. The mirror is off screen. So the mirror is almost in the place of the camera. And thus, what I think Bergman and, and Nyquist are doing here is they're asking us, in what ways do, does a face create that expression? Um, we're all internal to time, right? We get clocks throughout this movie repeatedly um, in the background, even inserts of it, and we're all internal to this time. But reading beyond the surface involves this interplay between what's, what is seen, what's actually seen, and what's the projection of the seer. So what we see within the face is it as as he's having as as the doctor's having you know she says you see this within yourself and i think what what bergman's asking us here is um a, a precisely about what what can the close ups do in terms of not just empathetic and emotional relationship but in terms of actually expressing something purely within the image itself that goes beyond the actor that goes beyond the character um so that's that's kind of the, the depth of where I wanted to go with close-up. I'm not going to read all of this. This is, again, one of those slides that's like, never make a slide like this. But just to, to give you a couple uh, other critical approaches very briefly. Um, Rice wants to read this film primarily as about ego sphere of physical death. Um, he reads red as alienating consciousness. Um, he reads even Karen's act of masochism against herself as both scourging her own sexuality as an act of repression, but also as expiation. Um, it's supposed to be an, a, vis a visual assault upon sensibilities, but it doesn't lead to real communication, just like the act of self-harm that Maria's husband uh, commits upon himself. He calls for her help, and she doesn't, she doesn't run into the frame with him. She just sort of recoils. Likewise, I think it's Frederick, who is Karen's husband. He just looks at her... Um, not with shock, not really even with disgust, but almost with pity. So even as an act of communication, that falls apart. This is what Rice points out. And thus he says it's it's primarily about the death of childhood, about a an effort for the temporary union between a self and other that dissolves the ego's prison walls. He believes the film primarily then at the end is optimistic because it allows for the possibility of Karen, if not Karen and Maria, then certainly Agnes and Anna to have their isolation cured through this uh, sort of artistic or aesthetic communication, namely through the diary. On the other hand, um, Joan Mellon views this as a deeply, deeply misogynistic film. She says that Bergman sees women as different and as other, which amounts to their utter dehumanization. Among other things, she, she documents um, kind of in painstaking detail the rather what, what she calls disgusting aspects of Agnes and Agnes's body and says that you can sense Bergman's repulsion in, in those. Um, she mentions that, you know, Bergman's men are allowed to have metaphysical and ethical malaise, but the women are just left to sort of suffer bodily. And she sees that also within like the loss of children and, um, it, you know, the barrenness or the, the misplaced sexual desire that we see throughout the film. Even Karen is, is mentioned as having five children, but we never see any of them on the screen. Um, and so Mellon reads it very, very differently. In fact, she reads the end of the film as, you know, all Anna gets as a memento for everything she's done from Agnes is her diary. She reads the diary about the happiest day of her life. And she talks about her two sisters being there who want nothing to do with her when she's actually suffering. And she doesn't mention Anna, who we see in the film, just in the background pushing. Right. So Mellon again reads it as, as a very, very pessimistic ending wherein this connection is not possible. Um, I'm going to skip here. I wanted to pay attention to some repeated gestures throughout the film. Um, interestingly here, so Liv Ullmann plays both the mother and Maria. And so we get this repeated gesture of sort of touching the face. And the first one comes from her memory, uh, from Agnes's memory of when she was a child and seeing her mother that one time really distraught. And that at that moment she reached out and provided maternal compassion to her mother, even though she didn't really understand the circumstances. She just responded through um, the emotion of the moment. And then this is echoed later when Maria is sort of reaching out and touching Karen's face. Um, and Karen first recoils, and then later they have a strong uh, intimate connection. And another way of understanding sort of a theme of compassion and motherhood, of course, comes through Anna, who 
unfairly, I think Mellon refers to as um, ugly and bovine, um, which I, I really don't think is fair. But we'll see here in the, the, the Pieta uh, image that she is the only one who actually physically, spiritually, emotionally is there to support Agnes as she's dying, um, clutching her here against her breast as she's suffering, just like we see in the Pieta of uh, Mary holding the dead body of Jesus. Uh, Bergman quoted in Wilson says, the film seems to hold the feelings of an unreal clinical encounter with a body, youthful, erotic, laid out between living and dying. It is steeped with fear and wonder. I believe that the film or whatever it is consists of this poem. A human being dies, but as in a nightmare, gets stuck halfway through and pleads for tenderness, mercy, and deliverance. Um, just a couple other ideas I had that I actually have hit on earlier um, that, that were repeated there. And one last thing I want to uh, bring up that I just sort of recalled as, as a way I think of understanding how the brutal nature of this film makes us confront um, the affect image and makes us confront both the extremes of human cruelty and the extremes of human compassion uh, came through a, a visual stimulus that I'm going to see here. If you look on the right with this close up of Agnes against the red background, I immediately recalled this. Um, what we'll see here is two, um, two, excuse me. Um, performance art pieces, there we go, by Marina Abramovich, who is a Yugoslavian um, performance artist. On the left, this is Rhythm Zero, stills from Rhythm Zero from 1974. This is two years after Cries and Whispers. And she uh, put herself in a public space with where you can see down here is on a table, a series of different um, instruments. Here's a candle, here's a whip, here's a feather, here's some glass, there's a gun on the table. And she sat there motionless and still and said that for six hours, anyone could come in and do whatever they wanted to her. And at first, people were very um, shy, she says. But then as the hours wore on, uh, people hit her, beat her, slapped her, um, cut her. Somebody held a gun to her head. And then by the end of it, when she finally stood up, everybody who had been there fled. And she said that she recognized that when they did that, they didn't want to confront the cruelty that they had done to her, that in sitting there as the uh, vulnerable, essentially at this moment, powerless without agency female body, it showed the extents of human compassion and human cruelty. And that what happened to her wasn't at all a reflection of her, it was a reflection of what was going on inside of the people that were volunteering and participating within this. She said it made her feel uh, the Madonna, the mother and the whore. On the other end, from 2010, this is the still taken from The Artist is Present, which is an installation she did for several years, where she would sit for eight hours a day, silent, just staring ahead, and there was another chair on the other side where people could come in and, and sit and just stare at her. Um, at first, people thought no one's going to do this, and then you know there were lines and lines and lines for every day as she sat for eight hours. People cried, um, had, had all sorts of intense emotional experiences, and um, in my notes, I'm not really able to pull it up, but she said that she was she was taken by this extreme need that people had just to have presence, just to face a human face. They didn't know her, they didn't necessarily get a response from her, but just to look and to face a human face and the power of the affect that came from that. And I think in looking at this image here, um, I wonder if she was inspired by the, the, the Bergman close-up. I'm not really sure, but it was something that, that was evoked within my memory. And I think it's a way of understanding that this film is about um, ways in which people respond to um, somebody on the cusp of death, who is particularly a woman who is lying there uh, vulnerable, and the ways in which people respond in the extremes of human compassion, but also the extreme of human cruelty. Um, with that, uh, that, that sort of wraps up my portion here. I'd be very curious to hear if there's questions uh, that people have, insights, uh, comments, feedback. My work cited um, is here, and I'll make this available for people. And uh, Cliff, you can go ahead and jump back on and uh, join in here. Let me, let me stop share. All right. Thank you, uh, TJ. Uh, very provocative. Thanks for, for that very thorough uh, unpacking of Cries and Whispers. Uh, let's again remind people that they can uh, join the conversation with either questions for TJ or uh, observations of your own. Uh, how would you react to Cries and Whispers when you saw it, uh, either for the first time or revisiting it? Um, 
I'm curious. Uh, 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 I hadn't seen Cries and Whispers in quite a number of years. Uh, and uh, I remember when I first saw it, I was uh, probably in, uh, I think maybe my freshman year of college. Um, and uh, I was uh, really distra- disturbed by the film. It, I almost uh, looked on a, uh, as a horror film on some levels, uh, particularly that latter portion when uh, we see uh, Agne- uh, Agnes in that, as you say, liminal state between life and death and she sort of becomes reanimated. <laughs> uh, that's a really chilling sequence. And, you know, there are other chilling sequences in it too. Uh, you know, Karen's self-mutilation was uh, extraordinarily disturbing to me with the first time I saw it. It still remains so. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. But but at any rate, uh, I'm wondering, uh, you've seen this film now multiple times as you were preparing for this. Did it retain that same sense of uh, disturbance for you? Um, and when was the first time you experienced it? And how did your reactions mutate over time, do you think? Yeah, um, thank you. I had, a, I had a similar experience, I think, to you the first time I saw it. I saw it when I was, um, I, I think, about seven years ago. And I had seen maybe three or four Bergman films, um, you know, had heard of this one, picked it up on the Criterion Blu-ray, um, and wasn't, wasn't really prepared for what what was before me. Um, I was also very disturbed by the incidences of self-harm all throughout the film. But in, in watching it several times, um, things that still that still affect me are, you know, the, the scene, not just Agnes sort of coming back from the dead or whatever we want to call it, but the, the scenes, uh, the shots in there of the reactions of her sisters in close-up, of the ways in which they go through fear, doubt, denial, rejection, um, abject horror. And another another scene is, you know, very early on in the film, there's an uninterrupted, almost two minute um, close up. It, mo- it moves, but it's all in close up of Agnes in agony. And those those scenes, that performance by Harriet Anderson, I was I was going to play some of it in an early draft of this presentation. And I just sort of thought, um, you know, why put everyone through that again? Because it is, it is um, so sort of deeply primally affecting. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it loses its sting after like six viewings. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, your quotations from uh, Joan Mellon and her uh, sort of reading misogynism into the treatment of Agnes and her agonies. You know, I, I did not get that at all. I actually, having unfortunately uh, i am of an age that i've been through any number of deaths of parents and mm-hmm. close uh, 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 close relatives where i was in the room for the dying process and i thought this film of any that i've ever seen captures that agonizing process um, really in a stark way and really brings you into it in, in, in a profound manner. Uh, and that's what I was looking at, uh, not the notion that t- she was somehow, you know, Bergman was somehow torturing her, uh, mm-hmm. but rather w- he was representing exactly what the dying process is like and how difficult it is uh, and how you do need this comfort <laughs> they, they can only be given by those close to you and how her sisters deny it to her only Anna is the uh, uh the caretaker uh, the potential lover it's never made explicit but it's sort of implied that uh, they have a relationship that goes beyond just simple maid and uh uh mistress uh but her sisters are unable to do that. Uh, and that's also referenced, I thought, a, a really terrific, uh, I'm sure you watched it, I, I'm guessing, on the Criterion disc, but it's available on the Criterion channel as an extra, uh, a, a piece by Koganada uh, that yeah. deals with touch in mm-hmm. this film mm-hmm. and solace, the offering of solace. And it's really amazing, I think, the way in which he homes in. You did some of it uh, in a brief way uh showing those examples but it, it's throughout the the examples of touching or the refusal to touch <laughs> uh being so mm-hmm. prominent so i'm yeah. just curious if you have any thoughts on any of the things that i just brought up <laughs> yeah absolutely and I, I wanted to include the melon piece mainly because it I, I had a similar reaction as i was reading it i was like wait what did we, did we watch the same movie but i i had to sort of distance myself and and recognize you know uh melon's piece i think came out in I think 73, so it was it was much more contemporary 
a reading of film as we have now. And of course, um, you know, she is she is watching the film as a woman. I'm watching the film as a man. Um, I'm sure that has some sort of bearing, perhaps, on on the way in which we're understanding the film. But I I also find some sort of uh, dignity in the unflinching portrayal in the longer uh, in duration close-ups uh, that are in there as a way of saying that I'm not going to um, truncate this with niceties of what's going through. Um, so I didn't necessarily read it that way, but one, one place I find an issue with her argument is, you know, she, she wants to have it where, um, you know, the men get to have, the Bergman men get to have the kind of ethical dilemmas of, you know, of Max von Sydow and, and the Seventh Seal and all of that, and then the women have to go through this. But as Agnes is right before she dies, she cries out, can't anybody help me? And I read that can't anybody help me as um, not just being limited to the people that are in the room. Um, and something else, you know, mentioning what you said that I think this film uh, touches on that's that's honest but disturbing is the way in which a, in these sort of deathbed watches, a lot of the time loved ones are called upon to a sort of ministry of presence where you are helpless, you know, there's no, you're not actually able to take pain away, you're not actually able to, um, you know, in suffering in certain ways. And, and there's a humility in sort of that, that must be involved in accepting that powerlessness that Karen and Maria are really, you can see their agitation that they're unable to accept, I don't want to be in here because I can't really do anything unless I feel kind of guilty or ashamed by it. Um, and I think that's, that's, another kind of interesting layer to Bergman's exploration of, of suffering that that is in this. Uh, yeah, and I was also struck too by, um, you know, the mother is, I think, really essential, uh, mm -hmm. you know, her, her presence, particularly with regard to Agnes and her desire to have some sort of closer relationship with her mother, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, she's trying to connect, I think, with her sisters during this dying process in a way of uh, also sort of connecting with her mother but again it's only Anna who's capable of doing it and she does it in a sort of distinctly maternal fashion she mm -hmm. offered you know she bears her breast as if to suckle <laughs> Agnes yeah. twice uh, mm -hmm. but also holds her tenderly uh, you know also wants the warmth of the human skin etc that's one of the uh, it's uh, I'm sure the real reason why she was doing it but by the same token it evokes that image she's the maternal figure mm -hmm. uh the love that she was essentially denied on some levels by her own mother. <laughs> it's finally <laughs> given by someone outside of the family and mm -hmm. the two sisters uh, are incapable of doing it themselves. Yeah, and it involves her stepping out of her social role as just, you know, servant um, into caretaker, mother, sister, perhaps lover, all of those other things that she has to uh, step out of her socially prescribed roles in order to do because the the blood bonds really were not there for Agnes to do those to do the um the to, to fulfill those other roles of human connection that she needs uh, it was interesting too uh when you showed the sequence in which um Erlen Josephson is making the woman uh, as Maria look at her her face I uh, I, had, uh, I was struck by how she's smiling throughout that entire process even though he's saying the most hurtful of things <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 and uh, you know, it's almost like uh, uh, on some levels I guess it reinforces one of his observations uh, it's not a it's not a sneer it's a smirk <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think it's also uh, you know as she articulates at the very end it's like you're not saying this about me you're see you're seeing yourself in this mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's very canny on her part because the men you know even if uh, uh, some feminist readings might say that uh Bergman is somehow mistreating the women and not fully understanding them uh you know recognizing them in their fullness uh the men in this film are god awful <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even, even the priest is extremely ineffectual right even the, even the priest is yeah um and what, what I think is interesting about that that scene that you point to in the 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 grin or the smile is it's a similarly sort of defiant smile that we see Karen give after her husband discovers her mutilation, which in that moment, you know, if, if we're going to read Maria's smile as, oh, I see what you're trying to do to me, but actually it's a reflection on you. Um, I think Karen is also trying to reverse that and saying, even though I harmed myself, I really did this to harm you. I did mm -hmm. this. I think the way she sees it is I did this to make myself, um, you know, unattractive, but also ineffective as as a spousal lover. 
Um, now, I, I'm curious as to how you read the conclusion of the film uh, in the sense that we uh, are sort of sent out of the theater after having this very grim experience for um, about 85 minutes of the running time. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and yet it ends on this note of, you know, this is, this is happiness, uh, the, the, this moment when she's together with her two sisters and with Anna, even though, as you point out, she's not noted in the diary but she is in the uh visualization of that memory uh it actually sort of sends us out uh with a at least a mild sense of uplift mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think that was intended or was it uh almost ironic on some levels on Bergman's part yeah that's a great question because I've always read it until I read um some of the the research that I did, I always read it as, um, you know, congratulations, you made it 85 minutes. Here's one, <laughs> you know, it's not all so bad. But, you know, that, nothing in Bergman is unambiguous. And so I think that with that, it's it's bittersweet in that, okay, it was a moment of happiness, but it's a moment of happiness that can't be reclaimed, that wasn't necessarily uh, shared with the person who is reading about the recollection of it now. And one that, you know, the all of the inserts to the clock show that time only ticks forward. So even though this moment existed for her, it's a moment that is literally past. It cannot be, it cannot uh, come back, but it's also a moment that prefigures the intense agonizing suffering that we're going to see. So I, I want to read it as, you know, um, she, she did find this moment, even though when faced it with the, the ugliness and sort of, uh, disgust of death that her sisters fled from her but it it certainly isn't um all pastoral uh, <laughs> so uh uh, we should, uh, before we, we're almost at the end of our time, we only have a couple more minutes, but I think we should take note of the fact that the, as always in Bergman's films, the uh, performances here are quite extraordinary. Um, I just wanted to, you know, did, did you have any particular uh, observations that you want to make on that front? I mean, I think Anderson's performance as Agnes is the most startling uh, and, and moving, but by the same token, Thulin and uh, Ullman both give, and for that matter, uh, and it, this was, I believe, her, uh, her first performance in a film, uh, oh, wow. uh, Carrie Sylvan. Sylvan, mm -hmm. I think that was her first film. It was certainly her first Bergman film, but I think it might have been her film debut. Mm -hmm. I, I thought they were all just extraordinary. I would agree. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, it's sort of uh, par for the course in a Bergman film. But yeah, Anderson's performance in particular is one that um, I, I sort of see different different things she's doing each time. And that I think the close, you know, close ups of of Liv Ullman are always um, extremely rich, but the intense close ups in of, of Anderson in this, I think, really do um, you know, reveal one of the quotes I had from Deleuze about um, the face doing things that the body isn't conscious of. Um, and just kind of the really long extended uh, moments that she's allowed to um, live in that performance, I think, I think, uh, pay off very intensely. Uh, there's a uh, nice interview with Harriet Anderson, by the way, uh, also as part of that uh, disc with the mm -hmm. Criterion collection, but also mm -hmm. available on the Criterion channel if you uh, if you have access to it as a, yeah. a viewer that I would recommend. She, uh, uh, there's also a uh, sort of behind the scenes footage nobody says they don't identify who actually took this footage but anyway uh there's a lot of laughter and fun on Bergman sets weirdly you wouldn't <laughs> think that but apparently that was very uh very much a part of his filmmaking process mm -hmm. that actually uh, it was a pretty light-hearted set uh, even if wow. dealing with extraordinarily grim material but you see all sorts of playful aspects with wow. the behind the scenes aspects uh, uh, with the actresses but she makes one uh, funny observation in the interview and that is she herself found quite amusing the uh, attempted suicide by uh, Maria's husband because I, she found it a little unlikely, you know, yeah. a sort of uh, <laughs> Japanese style suicide, but uh, uh, highly ineffective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she she said that she found that funny more than uh, disturbing. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know if I agree with that, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it, it gives you a different insight into the sort of sure. Bergman uh, aesthetic. Uh, that yeah, the, those humor. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, and also the, the actresses themselves had such a great time on the set. Yeah. And, and we can see, you know, he has return collaborators all throughout his career that, you know, you watch any two or three of his films and you go, oh, wait, that's so-and-so from this one. You know, he really had kind of a, a coterie there. So, yeah. And of course, in the case of the women, most of them former lovers as well, right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, uh, again, uh, uh, from today's perspective, uh, raises some interesting issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, uh, thank you so much, TJ. We have reached the end of our time. Uh, we've actually ticked a, a minute or two past, but that's okay. Uh, very much appreciate your uh, your contributions here. We hope to have you back in the future for uh, Golden Anniversaries. I want to remind everyone who's watching that uh, this and all of our virtual conversations about uh, the films from 1972, and for that matter, previous years, are available on the Cinema St. Louis uh, channel on YouTube. So um, if you enjoyed this and you want to recommend it to others, please, it'll be up probably within the next day, certainly no later than uh, uh, midweek, uh, you'll be able to access it and uh, spread it far and wide. Thanks. Thank you, TJ. Yep. All right. Thank you.